Thank you. Uh, we have a question, and Nduta says it's for you, but probably this is something uh, uh, Clay could comment on. Are there theories which can be applied in studies to critically assess and analyze the impact of ICT4D besides uh, sense capability approach and uh, sustainable livelihoods framework? You said me or start? Uh, you, but something she can't come to. The authority only knows she's the cheerleader for it. Yeah. Um, well, the, the yeah. The, so the so the the answer was the answer was the great academic's answer was you know, read my book. Um, um, well, it's not a book, unfortunately. It's a working paper. Um, we did in a couple of years ago, myself and uh, Alan Moller, we did a compendium of ICT for the impact assessment frameworks, and that goes through a whole list of ones that I am not going to mm, go through, but it was all of the impact frameworks that we could find that had been used to date in terms of impact assessment. And I guess it was fairly comprehensive because it went from kind of economic, quantitative through to the qualitative, like to even include probably a bit of mention of, 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 grounded, uh, of grounded theory. So yes, there are far too many theories, probably more of the answer uh, to that. And, and the more difficult thing is, working out which one to choose depending on what the particular research software is. Do you want to comment? For example, if, you know, in, in a, the capabilities logic is very much aligned with an understanding of sort of human development which goes beyond growth, which talks about kind of social um, and hopefully in the future also environmental aspects. Uh, sustainability theory and work in that area is already talking about social and environmental aspects as well as growth. Um, so, it kind of depends what you, what you think about as development and then how it then also fits with the particular sectoral, uh, sector that you're working in or the context that you're working in. So fit matters um, and I'd, you know, I'd be the first to argue that we shouldn't, you know, hopefully we, we won't basically see ICT4D um, erupt in trends. So you know, one year there's a significant book on the capabilities approach coming out with a trend, and then the next year, what you know, whatever trend that is. But we do need more engagement with theory, um, and I, I think that the special issue that um, that you edited, um, that basically um, in, in ITID, which basically also highlights some kind of key theories. Um, in um, ICT for D is, is very useful. I think also that the colleagues over, it's going to be heresy, but the colleagues over at IFIT 9.4 are doing some excellent theoretical work, and it's worth looking at the other conference there as well. Um, our colleagues in information science in, in, in that group are, are doing some excellent theoretical work. I think our, our, our area is becoming more theoretical, more theorized, and I think that's a good thing. We're learning languages in which subsets of people can communicate on a much more conceptual level. Thank you. Can, uh, I, can I just say a little bit more on that? Because I, I kind of, it's not that I take issue, but I think, unfortunately, I, one would wish that the world were as, as Dorothy has described it, but I think, unfortunately, fads and fashions matter a lot. Not in terms of getting your PhD, but in terms of if you want to get cited and if you want to have an impact with, with your research, and therefore you do... I'm highly cited. Why am I highly cited? Because my work's better than everybody else is absolutely not. But because I've kept an eye out for trends and trying to, when you're picking a theory in your PhD, what you've really got to do is ideally pick something that is going to grow and grow and grow if you want to get highly cited and if you want to have um, a strong record. Dorothy is going to disagree with me. Yeah, I think, I think I'm, I'm, I'm the eternal idealist, but in a way I'm also the exact counter example. So my decision to work with the capabilities approach was not strategic. Um, but nevertheless, clearly there's currently a kind of, uh, sort of a, a fashion around the capabilities approach and I actually hope that you know, if it's if it's got a got a hope to basically continue and sustain, then it has to be in some kind of fashionable idea. What I'm trying to get at is that we basically need to be clear about what we mean by development in this field. And there will be some people who will su subscribe to basically a more holistic understanding of development, and they will need theories like the capabilities approach to express that. And that, to me, is basically why you know I, I was looking for a theory that could express the kind of the, the ideas of development 
uh, sort of a more pluralistic approach, a more participatory approach, and I needed this capabilities approach to get me out of a, a mismatch, a cognitive dissonance between the theories that I was reading and the kind of things that I believed. Just a small comment on the PhD dissertation and the relationship between theory and the actual material you have. The theory you choose or end up working with will not be the only value of your of your work, especially not if you're doing um, not doing a, the type of PhD where you have several articles. If you do a monograph, the data that you collect and the moment that you capture and your empirical data will also be of immense value to future researchers. So on the one hand, you have the data that you have collected that is unique, and you bring that to the research community because actually you capture that moment, you capture that process. And the theories that you use are supposed to elucidate that data. On the one hand, yes, you can think strategically and pick a theory that's going to be based so that you do get cited, that you do get read. On the other hand, there's a value as Dorothea says, to think about, okay, what do I want, well, how do I want the theory and my data, my empirical data to interact, what do I want to show, where do I want to go. So there are several aspects uh, in which your, your PhD and your work will be useful, so it's not only about picking the most popular theory or trying to pick something that's very, very unique. It's sort of, it has to be, it has to be an organic. Um. For sure, I know uh, professors uh, Can I agree with Richard for a moment? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I thought one point that, that I think is, is, is um, where I think we can really, where I can certainly reiterate what, what Richard was hinting at, was this idea that it's easier when you're not the only one. Um, so uh, do you know what, whatever approach you choose to take, try to figure out who else is out there um, and um, try to kind of build a, a kind of a community. And don't just let your supervisor be the only community that you have. Um, you know, there's, there's often there's can be a group of people um, who understand where you're kind of coming from. And when you're in the middle of writing, you're kind of writing up your PhD and so on, you will draw on them as a, as a source of, you know, I'm not mad. Other people think like this as well. I'm not on my own. Um, so in that sense, you know, look, look after your mental health uh, and, and do make sure that you've got a community of, of people who have a sort of a similar idea. In, in Manchester, we say find your tribe, which is, you know, try out a number of different conferences, see who you really feel that you fit in, and then just and then just keep going with them and don't kind of spread yourself out thinly, touching a lot of different bases, but really go with them and really stick with them. The, the, the people, the PhDs we know who sort of get the jobs at the, at the end are the ones who really kind of find the tribe, focus on that, and make, connections, make contacts within that group, and make them as deeply as they can within the PhD process, rather than jumping around at a number of different points. Um. I was going to say that uh, for sure professors are not prophets, so uh, I hope you can answer Anand's question. What are the upcoming trends or challenges in the area of ICT for D, according to the panel? Uh, how should PhD research, researchers prepare for those trends and challenges? Uh, and does the panel believe more and more interdisciplinary research will be carried out in the field of ICT <laughs> Upcoming trends and challenges. Mm -hmm. Should we separate them in the three that, that you have there? For those questions, which are really, you know, really broad and, and futuristic, but um, I think it's something that it's, it's you know, I'd, I'd love to hear what people in the audience say because hey, you know, we're, we've all got our own positionalities on this. Um, my sense is that um, uh, ICT for D is growing up. Hallelujah! Finally, um, we're I think we're becoming less uh, less 
and sort of hyper excited about sort of the latest thing and you know, what kind of my my best here, you know, less of the hurrah for my thing stuff and some more kind of big picture discussions. Um, I think we've possibly um, come sort of through a, a phase where, well, we've now possibly in a sort of a puberty phase, or we've seen a puberty phase of going, of going, oh, but my fail is bigger than your fail. Um, I hope that we're kind of moving beyond that phase to also a more considered discussion uh, around learning. Uh, and um, I hope that we can move to uh, sort of a, a more considered debate and in dialogue with the wider development studies field. Um, fundamentally, um, if we're kind of thinking about this as ICT for development, there is a directionality in development is the kind of is the is the direction of travel, and there's some big debates there. Um, I'm not sure how probably this will come up um, from other panel panel members as well, but there is a huge debate around ecological sustainability, not just project sustainability, but ecological sustainability, sustainable to with a capital S coming up. Um, there's a question around <coughs> ecological limits. That's kind of, for me, in, in you know, the final chapter of the book, that's kind of my sort of also a direction of travel conceptually. Um, and uh, I think there's um, uh, possibilities to think about um, development theories that help us towards thinking kind of this, this kind of bigger picture stuff. And I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel of the theory in SD4D. There's a lot of kind of theory out there which can be also used in our field. And I'm looking forward to those dialogues. Um, that would have been my comment for the number one. Um, and then he, he'd like to ask some questions around um, how do PhD uh, students prepare and so on? Can we do that for now, which on the first one? Um, hopefully. Um, <coughs> I'm, I'm tempted to say that the main challenge is climate change and the way we should prepare is learn to swim. But, um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I kind of already answered those questions when I gave my presentation about post-2015 and analyzed the, the, the kind of the, the continuing um, priorities in development and the, and the new priorities in development and how those are going to uh, shape my CT for I, I mean, my main answer will be in oh, I, 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 I guess I already answered that. But Dorothy had plugged her book, allow me to plug somebody else's, allow me to plug somebody else's book, which is Ben Ramalingham's book, Aid on the Edge of Chaos, which is really arguing about how we need to uh, change the whole view about how we see development. And that uh, I kind of said this already in my uh, post 2015 discussion briefly, but how we need to move to understand these complex adaptive systems. And I think from that spills out a whole load of things. I mentioned a couple of them in terms of looking at uh, agile approaches, in terms of looking at uh, resilience, ideas about emerging leadership. There's a whole set of new ways of thinking about approaching development in this new paradigm for development that may. Um, and I think all of those have got implications for ICT research. So I, I, I think, damn, I keep coming to the second question already, but I mean, in terms of preparation, I would, I would say start reading about that, start, engage, start engaging, it really flows Dorothy was saying, start engaging with the big issues, as I already said earlier on this afternoon, sustainability is the big issue that's coming out post 2015, there's a whole set of other things. So start engaging with that so that you understand what are the big issues in development because that's a key field that we're engaging in. And I think everybody here kind of, we all have enough of a technical background to engage with ICT trends and have some understanding of them. So the gap for many ICT video researchers is developing trends and really understanding what those are and making sure they're engaging with them. Uh, Dr. Katia, do you believe more and more interdisciplinary research will be carried out in the field of ICT for D? Yes, but I would like to add my little to sense to this previous number one answer. One of the things that Spider has been focusing on and I've been thinking a lot about during this conference, uh, during the past four days, is not only do you need to look at the big issues, the sustainability, the climate change, the big theories, but also have your eye on the practitioners. Uh, connecting research to actual practice and making your results and thinking with what will actually be done and what good will your research and ideas do in the end and how to bridge that gap because it's quite difficult. 
um, and Spider has been trying to, we've been working on a practical level trying to con make that connection and it is quite tricky because it's two quite different fields even even if both are in development and, and fighting with the same issues like MDG goals etc. The endeavors are quite different and researchers need to think about how to connect to practitioners, how to make the research valuable, operational, I mean, how do we make it in the end useful, immediately useful for something else other than our own publication list and citation list and, you know, careers. So that's also an important moral aspect of this whole endeavor. I, I just want to totally agree with that and, and um, get out into the field. It's, yeah. This is in terms of preparation. I'm, I'm thinking that the paper I wrote about ICT for you 2.0, that came from a week spent in Bangalore just hanging around with a bunch of ICT for you projects. You just really get uh, an insight you just cannot get when you're stuck in, in, in the university setting. So I think that's a key preparation that enables you to balance alongside the kind of big intellectual issues what is actually going on on the ground, what practitioners don't get into the ground. Can I come into this interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary? So, um, just to maybe add to the conversation so far, I, I also think um, <coughs> it's it's about teamwork and it's about division of labor. So that means that an individual, if you're doing a PhD, you're almost sort of trained to be in this mindset that you know you're the project manager of your your own project. It all depends on you, and you're kind of you've got your X amount of years that you need to pull this through, and everything depends on you. And that suggests that you have to kind of all of a sudden become an expert in everything if you're trying to actually achieve something. And I think um, that's kind of that's probably a, a direction towards kind of three things. One is a heart attack. Um, second is um, probably a high degree of frustration, and thirdly, possibly uh, failure in uh, a viable situation because your methodology won't stand up to that. So, so in, in a sense, choosing uh, what what is your basically your expertise set and understanding where the limitations are is going to be absolutely vital. Now, I know it's really hard to square that with the PhD process, but I think looking ahead. Um, towards an academic career or towards practice, I think at that point the different disciplinary strengths, the different sets of expertise need to work together, but they don't need to be unified in all one person. Um, and we had this earlier uh, discussion in the in the teaching ICT for D session, um, and I think one of the things that kind of came out from that was this idea that we need to learn where our limitations are. So a social scientist needs to have some kind of respect for the technical <coughs> expertise that it takes to do good programming or good design. But equally, we need to get away from uh, des sort of des technical designers or programmers who basically just sort of um, stick on a little sort of element of like a questionnaire or uh, you know, five interviews with some users, kind of, or worse, as, as Paula pointed out this morning, you know, sort of, um, a, a week with more thing in the field and call it an ethnography. Those those kinds of um, sort of quick fix elements that basically you know overclaim um, expertise, which are really coming from a different domain and different expertise. I think just be careful with that. I think as a field we need to be cautious of that, while at the same time being really respectful of different kinds of expertise and how we can work together. Can I, can I just say one more thing about the kind of dis disciplinarity? Um, maybe I'll trick, so I just sort of thought of it, but it, it, it's often so, it, it's perhaps that great academic careers are built within single disciplines, but very good academic careers are built by, by kind of crossing. You know, we've got a couple of very good books in front of us, I think it would be fair to say with Dorothy, you took an idea from development studies and you moved it into ICT, then Ramalingam has taken uh, the idea of complexity science, and he's moved it into he's moved it into development, and so there's an awful lot of mileage in being a bit of a hybrid and being a bit of a straddler because you see ideas from one place and you bring them into another. And of course, we're we're perfectly placed for that in ICT because we're already straddling at least a couple of uh, a couple of disciplines. So I don't know whether there's going to be more or less because we all know as academics there are serious pressures to be monodisciplinary if you want to get promoted. 
um, and, and serious pressures in terms of getting new funding sometimes against uh, multidisciplinarity. But I think that notion of bringing ideas from one discipline into another is the I mean, basis for much of what I've, uh, <coughs> what I've done. And I think, I think that can be a very solid basis for, for very good work. Uh, I will open uh, the questions to the audience. Uh, can, can we uh, take him first? Because I have his questions, but I want him to read them. Can I read it from your tab? Because I looked it up and I can yes. find it. about any experiences and examples that you have about ICD for D efforts in zones of conflict or efforts for ICD for D for peace. I, didn't, I don't think you have that because I didn't write it down. So, um, so it was in parallel to the question that Edgar um, kind of posed at the beginning which is related to governments and to me it was it's a little bit also kind of an issue that's very big and very powerful and makes sense to pay attention to, but still, I mean, I personally have looked a little bit before coming here because I'm personally interested in this issue, and I couldn't really find anything that's related to, I mean, long, um, um, serious effort related to ICT for the projects that are dedicated for conflict and for peace. So could you comment on this? Uh, okay, I mean, uh so Mike, Mike Best just published in communications of the ACN this uh, piece about ICTs and peace building. Mike's, Mike's done quite a bit of work on, um, on ICTs and peace building. And uh, certainly, so I mean, first of all, I should also kind of agree that I think absolutely it's going to be uh, a, a growing area. If you look at the trajectory of, of, uh, of development, I was putting in a bit the other day, and I looked at the, the, the list of DAC countries that that kind of uh, fall into the least developed countries are the ones that you've got to focus on for DFID. And I guess I haven't put a bid for a little while, but I was amazed by how the list of countries has shrunk, which is great, of course, in developmental terms. But in a way, development studies is, is kind of doing itself out of, out, of a, out of a job. And I kind of, I joke to my colleagues that in 10 years' time, when you turn up in a development studies department, you'll be offered, well, you can either study Congo, or you can do Somalia, or you can do Afghanistan, because that's all that's left. Uh, in, in terms of you know the, the, the countries, the more serious point is that humanitarianism, conflict resolution, and peace building all are clearly going to become more and more important as development focuses on those countries which are um, least have, have the most intractable uh, problems. So I think it's very I think it's very much an area to look at. Mike has done work. The, flip, the flippant remark on top of um, the, the um, story about what's left in, in 10 years' time could also be that if we change our paradigm of what we mean by development, then at least for us, we can redefine developing countries. And so if you take sustainable development, all countries are developing countries. If you take capabilities approach, all countries are developing. Um, so um, it may not be where the funding flows, um, but you, you can certainly think about um, also inequality as major development challenges that are coming up, and um, also academic funders who are interested in impact, um, but not necessarily describe themselves as development funders, might be also a future sources of, um, of funding. Certainly, I mean, we, we recently had some uh, funding from the, uh, from the UK ESRC, uh, Economic and Social Research Council for Brazil and for Chile, and they totally got the idea that you know inequality um, is the issue. It's not poverty, and I think in the context like South Africa, many of us have understood some of that as well. Um, yeah, I, um, one of the beauties of, of, of sort of teaching um, ICD is that you basically understand who you would ask. Um, so for your question, apart from my best, I would ask also Ollie Parsons, um, and I would ask Tim Kelly um, for uh, for more info. And, and I think you know, as for D is a, is a quite, in a sense, it's a community um, where uh, people do share quite freely, and it can be quite a, you know compared to 
other academic communities, it's a fairly warm community, guys. Um, uh, and they will share. Um, so I think that's generally for us, you know, maybe um, pointing each other to people who would know. So there's three names for you where you can kind of go on and ask some more about that particular area. But I think it needs more work, yes. Just two quick points there to, to add on that. One of them jumping back to the to the earlier question, which which Dorothy has kind of implicitly already alluded to, which is of course the fact that the great majority of the world's poor now live in middle income countries. Um, not the great majority, the majority of the world's poor now live in middle income countries, not least developed, uh, least developed countries. Um, and the second thing is is the is the a small increase in work on the military, the role of the military in, in development, which is starting to emerge as well. And that'd be another angle that one could. Uh, one could look at, though. Of course, I mean, of course, we all realise it's incredibly challenging to try and do this kind of to try and do this kind of research. Okay. It's on the million dollar goal uh, looking ahead. So, in the, in 2000, the two objectives, seven was environment, eight was coordination of donors, were the least constraining, and they were actually those affecting the so-called developed countries. In, in those two issues that you raised before, so climate change is becoming more and more uh, an urgency, we keep uh, saying hurricanes, devastating things when the top conference is going on, but it seems that the, the audience are in denial completely at, at the uh, decision-making level. Do you, from your observatory, see some hope in a, in a trend whereby the so-called developed countries start questioning their development models to some extent, or is still a top-down, one-direction develop, developing without really you know, looking at the limits, looking at the, the what's not going well? in that direction. I know you answered already about, about resilience, but I would like to have a one. So we, we, we put in a bid in, I can't remember, I think it was 2008 for a project in ICTs and climate change, which I, which I kind of said, yeah, this, is, this, is, this is going to be great, it's going to be a real big project, absolutely financial, and of course, straight afterwards, economic crash, northern countries are just not interested in climate change anymore, because you know, we've got to dig ourselves out of a different hole, and, and that's why climate change is kind of not disappeared, to be fair, but but it's but it's kind of uh, yeah, correct. <laughs> it's, uh, it's gone down like that. <coughs> what's going to happen um, in future? I honestly don't know. It's sort of it's kind of it's a bizarre situation we're in, isn't it? That you look at one level and kind of say, but there's this vast thing that's about to happen to the planet if you're not really careful. And on the other hand, people are just kind of, oh Lord, never mind about that. We've got to try and get our growth rates up and. Uh, um, so, will the models of development in the global north change? I don't know, and I think what's very important is what's the narrative we can give to development. There was a very strong narrative around the MDGs because they were so simple and clear, and there was a very strong link narrative around kind of um, live aid around debt, making poverty history. I think a lot depends on. Uh, the NGO. One of the big problems with the NGOs at the moment, a lot of the M NGOs are very, the, the kind of the advocacy organisations are very engaged with trying to influence the post-2015 agenda. What they are not engaged with is, can we think of a big narrative around development that we can sell to populations in, developing, uh, to, in, in the global north? Because if we don't, then fairly clearly development will slip down the agenda and, and, and heaven knows how it's holding up in the UK with, with, the, with the Tories for example and uh, isn't it in Holland who uh, uh, there's the, the party that says it's, uh, it's, it's target for aid is not 0.7% but 0.0% um, you know I, I, I don't know how I don't I suppose it depends how we feel how we feel as well the, the aid, aid development all those things are kind of under pressure at the moment because Everybody in the global north is looking to their own household budgets. Are they going to survive? Are we going to stay in a job? And so on. And actually, perhaps, one should celebrate the fact that, that we still care about development and climate change to the extent that we do. We haven't been completely inward looking and unselfish. And therefore, maybe, you know, <coughs> turn outwards again in the future. May I be provocative? Yeah. Um, I'm thinking about the future of development and the future of the world. I could very briefly kind of maybe can't just come in. Um, I think 
if, if, um, if you're looking at the balance of profitability, you know, we're probably dancing on the Titanic. On? On the Titanic. Okay. But um, if you're looking for sources of hope, there are sources of hope. And that's kind of what, in a, in a geography department where I sit, you know, there's a lot of discussions around that. It's like, you know, goodness gracious, you know, Kyoto sort of can get renewed, you know, what's, what basically what, what's happening now. Um, and I think some of the sources of hope are probably not necessarily to be found at the kind of the political level. So, you know, if you're kind of feeling down and out about it, um, maybe read um, uh, J.K. Gibson Graham, who basically talk about sort of an alternative way of um, practicing localized resistance in, in basically capitalized, uh, capitalist unsustainable structures. Um, so, so I think there are some sort of narratives that are, are worth checking out. There's a lot of innovation going on, you know. Um, I think um, the question is where is IT in this? And is it more part of balance, more part of the problem, or more part of the solution? At the moment we've got a completely unsustainable business model behind our mobile phone. E-waste is a growing problem. You know, the amount of kind of kit that goes into various projects without the logical kind of um, recycling loop, etc., is is huge. So probably at the moment, um, you know, sort of there's there's a lot of kind of IT that's driving the existing unsustainable model rather than subverting it and breaking it. But there are some examples. We recently did some some work um, on. Uh, looking at e, at e procurement actually and asking citizens what kind of criteria they wanted the state to use when making buying decisions <coughs> in Brazil and Chile. So the public coffers there are fairly full and it was basically asking about, you know, how do you want the state to spend your money? And you could use IT to kind of also you know, sort of pull on some of these things. And there was great support by the populace to take social and, environment, uh, social and environmental criteria into account and pay more on the economic side to have that taken into account. Now, if that means that you know, a state like Brazil already all of a sudden basically puts energy efficiency into their procurement criteria, wow, that's a shift. Uh, that's, that's kind of a seismic move. Um, we also then see kind of uh, a kind of a, an effect with businesses that they adapt to that and so on. So I think there are some policy levers, and there are some policy levers that can basically potentially be articulated through IT. Participatory budgeting and participatory procurement is something that I'm quite interested in because it potentially gives a scale you know, beyond um, sort of small scale ethical consumption. And I'll stop there because I could go on. I can, I give, can I give just two quick things? One is, how does ICTs link in? So maybe reading also Castell's Networks of Outrage and Hope, because although it's not specifically uh, focused just on ICTs, those underpin those all of those social movements that he's uh, looking at. And then drawing out of that as well, I think uh, there's an interesting research agenda around ICTs and Hope. We've just done a bit of foundational work on that in uh, in Manchester, and and you can look at hope, kind of hope as an input to ICT putting projects, what people hope hope for, and also as a as an output from our ICT projects. And interestingly, particularly in developing countries, ICT seem to engender a sense of hope in people, um, perhaps far beyond what what rationally one uh, one would, an, would would anticipate, and certainly in a very different way to what one would typically see in the in the developed in the developed world. People really believe. Maybe not correctly, but they really believe that ICTs are going to help bring a positive future, and that sense of hope within them is actually a facilitated mechanism for many other development, you know, being active developmentally and not being a hopeless person and thinking, well, you know, let's withdraw into fatalism. There's nothing we can we can do about that. So, so I mean, we've only done very basic work, but there's some very interesting question there about the relationship between ICT. So I just, I just wanted to be quick. This morning we had a, an open session with my colleague Tony, which is also a PhD student, and we were trying to address this idea of development and discussing. And yes, we do have trends, but I will rather try <coughs> for us to push some trends as well. It's like, at least for the two of us, we are really concerned with the social structures that are constraining and causing some of these problems. And sometimes 
which is very related to what you said at the beginning, what are we doing about governance and, and corruption and things like that. So how are we challenging through our work or through the, our voices in a way to, to make these changes? And that's something that I think we need to address as well, not just to see the trends and where can I work on who am I getting the money to do something, but as well how can we be in a way in a way, activists to make development more meaningful on a kind of capability approach as well. So, just to provoke. I mean, I mean, I mean on, on that, so you first of all have to start off well, what, first thing to say, the MDGs didn't have anything about systemic structural transformations. They, you know, they were, of course, silent on that. And we can pretty well bet that the post 2015 agenda will, will, will uh, you know, pretty much be the same. Um, so I don't know if you know Thomas Pogger's work, but he's got some very interesting stuff. But he came and gave a talk for, for us a couple of weeks ago in Manchester. And he's got a great analysis about the MDGs and post-2015, and he has actually got a specific set of structural goals that, that, uh, that he would, he would uh, set, which I kind of thought were very, very innovative. So one of the examples was, well, the arms trade is a bad thing. Um, but you're never going to ban the arms trade. So what we should do instead is we will, we'll just have a kind of an international tax on the arms trade. So if as a northern country you wish to indulge in that and sell loads of small arms to, uh, to Africa, the fuel conflict and, 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 and violence, you can carry on doing that, no problem. But you'll pay um, a tax on that into uh, a central international development fund. And he looked at many of the kind of the bads uh, that, it, that exist, the systemic bads that exist around the kind of global finance and, and, and so on. And we kind of got suggestions about how we might deal with that, not in a kind of we're going to regulate this out of existence, but how we can use kind of a little more sort of like behavioral economics sort of uh, nudge, nudge mechanism. So an interesting question will be, what's the relationship of ICTs to all those things? How could ICTs help to support some of those structural transformations? But you have to start with you know, understanding what are the structural, and agreeing, what are the structural and systemic transformations that, uh, that, we, that we seek to occur. But running back to networks of outrage and hope, for example, we might be interested to say, well, we want to support bottom-up <coughs> how can we use ICTs to um, support those, how can we also monitor the increasing surveillance of, the, of states of what's going on in cyberspace, how can we create some more uh, open open spaces within the cyberspace to support social movement. So that, again, there's research, they, they, you know, there's, there's a research agenda there very much around, which of course there's already plenty of work done on, though not so much in the global south, but about ICT support and emerging social movements and supporting those who are seeking structural and sustained transformation. And the governance and what uh, Edgar mentioned in the beginning, just because governance and anti-corruption wasn't in the MDGs, doesn't mean that practitioners didn't end up working with them in practice in trying to reach for the set goals. Uh, one of the examples is very practical that you researched on is that in order to improve healthcare in a particular region, they, the, the project had to deal with poor service delivery, corruption, transparency, accountability, and ICTs were a part of dealing with that issue. And the final goal was to improve um, healthcare, but the intermediary goal, so you went through the actual structural, you actually do go through structural change and deal with those issues and creating forums for discussion, creating um, better accountability and allowing youth to participate in good governance, or democracy, etc. So that's being done while, while you're doing other things. So it's not as hopeless as it may seem just because it's excluded. No, but it's like you have to look in many different areas and even outside ICT4D, just to go back to the issue we talked about, um, volatile um, um, uh, shocks and yeah, shocks and uncertainty. There's a lot of research that's done and a lot of work that's done, but not under the ICT for the lab, uh, label. I know that the um, Swedish um, Army a Military Research Institute are they're doing lots of work and research on dealing with natural disasters and dealing with other things. And a part of that is also, of course, ICT. Their research will, of course, their focus will be slightly or not so slightly. Uh, affected by the policy, the, the, the politics, etc., 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 but it's still being done and it's still open to the public and it's open to use. So there are many, many things are being done, but it's all scattered occasionally. Briefly, um, 
I think that these kind of structural questions are incredibly important and it's, an, it's something that has become sort of less fashionable in a kind of largely neoliberal kind of development setup. Uh, we're talking a lot more about agency than we're talking about structure. Um, but let's be clear, you know, there's, uh, there are particular, there are different ways of being an academic. There's one way of basically identifying where the next funding pots are going to be and um, where money is going to come from and then betting on that horse. Um, and that means that the, the powers that be that also control the money, they don't necessarily have an interest in asking big structural changes. Um, then there's kind of the, the kind of impoverished Cassandra figure that basically calls out in the, in the wilderness but never gets any funding but makes some important points. I think there's a lot of value in that figure. Um, but you know, they need a lot of kind of resilience to kind of carry on with that. And then I think there is something about um, identifying in your funding landscape um, you know, who, what are sources that you can kind of tap into um, for the size of, of the kind of um, project that you are kind of thinking about. And it's easier, particularly for social scientists, because they don't need so much kit. Um, and it's particularly easier you know, for uh, academics who are on permanent positions and who are not looking out for their next postdoc. Um, but I think with that comes a responsibility. So if you are an academic and you are you know, sort of in, a, in a relatively safe position, then I think you, you do have a responsibility to think about big picture issues and in how far are you implicated in the existing kind of power structures <coughs> and in how far is it your role to challenge. Um, I actually have two questions. The first one is kind of a simple um, question, but um, I think it might not be an easy one. Uh, speaking of the interdisciplinary research, I come, I come from a um, discipline which is called communication. People might be wondering what do you do as a PhD student in communication, right? Is that something related to journalism, news reports? So, I'm wondering, apparently in different fields, we have different criteria in terms of how we evaluate a good theory. So I wanted to hear from you guys, as an experienced scholar in the ICT development sort of field, what is a good theory for studying development issues? Well, I would say what is a good theory it depends. For me, it's, I'm a social anthropologist, a theory is, is a tool, and it depends on what it allows you to to do with your material and how, what it makes visible in the material, what arguments you can write, or uh, conclusions you can draw from your material and what it allows you to see. At the same time, of course, every theory has a flip side in the sense that it elucidates certain things and obscures others. And of course, since we're talking about, also we're talking about moral issues and as Dorothea said, the Cassandra thing, what will you be saying? How will you be using your voice as a scholar? And um, it will also, of course, play into how you will be presenting the field, your field of research, um, to outside, to other scholars, and potentially to the field itself, as everything is interconnected and you should be very prepared for the fact that uh, your informants, your field, will be reading your research or either agreeing or disagreeing with it. So a good theory needs to meet several requirements. It needs to meet the intellectual, the, the, the very process of research, where you apply some, the theory to the material and see what, what happens. But it also needs to, in the ideally in research in general, but even more so in the development field, you need to have the moral aspect. How will this, what will it do in the future? Where will it go? And of course, as Dorothea said, that it's not the most, doesn't necessarily have to be the most popular theory, but you need to think about what are you contributing to and what's your voice going to be in the future. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I mean, theories. You, you've clearly got the kind of the, the intellectual contribution of the theory, what it helps to elucidate, and then going back to my uh, kind of the rather, you know, then there's the instrumental value of, of, of it in terms of your own career and thinking about who's going to listen, who's going to listen to you uh, if you pick a one particular theory and not another particular theory, and I think you've got to find some balance between those, between the intellectual and the, the instrumental. Or it can be, 
Well, we've kind of um, covered most of the, the kind of the first question, which was about what's a good theory. So I'm not going to labor that one. The second one was about social capital. Because I think there's different ways of reading that. So in an instrumental sense, you know what? That was hot like 15 years ago. Don't do that now, because you know, hot other theories are hot now. In a actually, you know, if you kind of look at the sort of resources that people are drawing on, especially uh, people who don't have a lot of material resources, um, social resources still matter. Um, as you know, I've kind of explained in, in, in this forum with the with my framework, choices framework, I basically um, point out to psychological resources as well. So I don't think we can stop at social resources. I think they're part of a, a wider resource set. I uh, have this awkward number of 11. <coughs> there might be more. Um, 11 is awkward. Um, but uh, that's kind of where, where I sit with there. And I think social resources are incredibly significant for um, people with limited material resources, but not just for them, it's for us all. Just, just, just on that, it's one of the one of the sort of, I don't know whether it is or not a little theme that I've picked up that I haven't picked up before, but of kind of the incursion of psychology into development and the incursion of psychology into ICT for D. There have been a kind of a couple of presentations, posters and, and, and so on like that. And that I, I don't know, that, that that's that's something I hadn't really picked up before. People who sort of properly say, well, I'm coming from a psychological uh, um, perspective, and I was at this year's Development Studies Association conference, and there was a little um, a session of uh, three or four papers on psychology of, of, of development. So that, that's, that's, that's something interesting. I mean, we're flipping back again to sort of you know, trends and, uh, and so forth. That's something I, I kind of think is, is interesting, something maybe to be keeping an eye on if you're thinking about it. Um, looking for groups of people who are working on an area and thinking about something that might be instrumentally useful for illuminating things we didn't see before, but maybe, uh, sorry, intellectually useful, but also instrumentally something that might be on the Good. Any more questions? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it will be the last one. So it's Going back to this, I mean, are these Trojan horses to come with this controlling, command and control mentality that is against the ecological thinking, systemic thinking you were referring to before? So it's true, you know, the, the country example you gave me about the of thinking of the resources of hope. Is that's true that we can do many things, leveraging technology to fight against climate change or whatever. Yet, in terms of questioning the mindset that developed countries have, it's really tricky. It's really a paradox because inside here, there's the mentality that is what caused problem in the first place and still when we come with this wonderful machine in our pockets people look at us like this is the way to go so I don't know just leave it there <laughs> there's a, there's a, there's a, beyond the, the instrumental value I think the symbolic value is what really tricks uh, where, where, the, where the problems stay the roots of the problem stays was it clear? ish we can work with it. <laughs> um, yeah, just uh, I've also packed up like a, a different mobile. So, so you know, just to to illustrate, um, I I basically have one for work and one for home. So the the, the home one looks got second hand, and it's um, it's kind of put together with a few kind of um, sellotapes, and it's now eight years old since I got it second hand. Um, and it doesn't do internet, or at least I don't want it to do internet. Um, and so I have a per I have a personal and I have a, a work life, and I like it that way. Um, so I think there is something about how much we can actually choose. You know, coming here to, to kind of capabilities, thinking around the lives that we have reason to value. The life that I have reason to value is to go offline, um, but still be available if, if there's an emergency and uh, of basically keeping my, my personal life and my work life 
separate or casual. Um, but translating that into technology, you know, takes some some work because, like you say, it's so easy to have it all go like together and, and so on. And so I think there's also some work to be done about us and our technology use and basically re-educating um, about you know what kind of lifestyles, like what kind of lives do we value and what do we want to do. I don't think we can necessarily blame the makers of the <coughs> mobile phone that they're basically banging out the latest model. There's nothing to say that we can't resist it in our own lives. Um, and um, you know, there's uh, there's uh, sort of other examples of, of, um, sort of uh, technology uh, use. You know, there's questions about you know how you how you work with email. Um, do you take uh, there's a there's a colleague in, in uh, the MIT who, for example, refuses to do um, uh, email on on weekends and evenings, and also takes a full day off the of uh, the internet per week as an internet saboteur. Um, so, so I think you know we have we have agency, you know, and we can use our psychological resources to actually shape the kinds of lives that we want. It's not like you know it's all kind of given. Um, and then we can maybe have a, a more informed dialogue. What kind of technology we want? Um, and I think that's that's another challenge. You know, as soon as we understand that the societies that we live in in the global north are unsustainable. And therefore, we need kind of a much more profound change, possibly also at the psychological level. One of the things that has to change is our relationship with technology more widely. And our colleague and friend uh, Ugo Valari, in, uh, in part of the alumni community of, the, of, of London ICT for D, um, has kind of set up the Restart project, which is just a simple idea of basically getting people together to basically have a repair party. So people bring their kind of old kitchen gadgets and toasters and mobile phones and everything together. Uh, and basically, similar to a hackathon, except they're basically restarting that material. So that's another, for me, that's a source of hope. You know, that, that we can think creatively about our relationship with technology and changing that. And surely that must be part of the answer towards a more sustainable kind of general future. So, yeah, I think so we have to kind of make a, just personal decisions to the extent we can make those decisions. We have the ability to make those choices between whether we think these devices increase our freedom or our, or our unfreedom. So I was going to get out my mobile device, but it's there. I don't have a mobile phone, and I'm not going to get a mobile phone because my belief is that it increases my unfreedom is more than, uh, more than my freedom. But I'm free to choose because I'm, <coughs> you know, I have, I have, I don't know, I can't have to put this properly, but you know, I have a, a certain perspective on the, on, the, on the world and I feel I have the ability to choose. I wonder if that's true for many people in the world that they do have that freedom of choice because there's a real danger of the kind of false consciousness that the association between new technologies and modernity means that many people feel that they don't have a choice. Um, and that they do have to pick up what could very well be a Trojan horse for consumerism, um, for um, perhaps for fewer freedoms than, than, than not. That could take us over. I mean, you know, one big issue we really haven't got into is whether our ICT is really going to save the planet or are they going to screw up the planet? And, uh, Fortunately, one of our jobs is to try and make sure it's the uh, um, saving the planet, not screwing up, uh, screwing up the planet. But it, it certainly, I think, you know, we, we all know well enough that there is no simple sense in which ICTs are going to lead us to a brighter and a better future. We all clearly, clearly see the danger signs that we're being drawn into. We see them and we have choices. To some extent, we have choices uh, to make. But many other people, I don't think they do particularly have choices about it. Whether or not to engage. Okay, that marks the chapter. That marks the